Welcome to this special event. I'm Frank Gailey, Executive Vice President and Provost here at Utah State University. I'm very excited to welcome you to this remarkable event hosted by Utah State University Center for Anticipatory Intelligence. If you haven't heard of this center, don't be surprised. Uh, it is brand new. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a groundbreaking effort launched just a year ago to establish what really is a first in, of its kind nationwide program to educate and train in anticipatory intelligence, uh, a field that combines science and STEM, uh, engineers, data scientists, biologists, with social science students who study geopolitics, national security, and social trends. These students fuse their expertise in problem-solving teams in order to better anticipate and design resilient strategies against security threats that are a result of the 21st century's emerging technologies. If it sounds exciting, it really is. Uh, Utah State University is on the front edge of this effort. The Center for Anticipatory Intelligence Leadership Team represented here in the first row would like to thank President Noel Cockett for her ongoing support for the program, including funding for this visit by our honored guests today. We would also like to salute the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Dean Joe Ward, for his leadership, which helped to pioneer this center, uh, uh, a center which now encompasses multiple colleges and more than 30 majors. We're excited to see so members, many members of our community here. I'd like to uh, call out especially our outstanding high school teachers who've made a special effort to bring their students here to share uh, in this event, as well as key leadership and many members of our impressive Utah National Guard. We welcome all of you and look forward to a wonderful hour spent with our special guest, Secretary Jim Mattis. I'm now very pleased to welcome the director for the Center for Anticipatory Intelligence, Associate Professor Jeannie Johnson. And when Jeannie gives some credit to Joe Ward for having some vision, I have to, she, you have to realize that a lot of that vision comes from her as well. She has tremendous experience in national security advising in the, uh, in the CIA. So with that, uh, Associate Professor Johnson will be here to introduce our special guest, Jim Mattis. Jeannie? Thanks for making room, everyone. I really, really appreciate that. I couldn't get our wonderful officers to let more of my beloved students in that door until we were all sitting down, so thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, today I have the honor of introducing a national treasure, an American hero, and a deeply good man. He is a dear friend of mine, and some of you know him as the patron saint of chaos, the warrior monk. I know, I know, the warrior monk. I, I would like to add another title to that list that may not sound terribly glamorous on the outset, but may be the most important thing he has done for our country across the last few years, and that is Bridge Builder. And I know it sounds like mundane work. It is the essential work of a great nation. So in his post as Secretary of Defense, I watched as he welcomed foreign defense ministers from all around the world and built bridges with them day in and day out. He traveled to them. And in one particularly memorable case, Indonesian special forces bit snakes in half just to impress him. So he was widely admired around the world, widely loved, deeply trusted. And it's trust that a great and powerful nation must establish with others in order for it to maintain its station. And for many of you, maybe you, like I, pack around his resignation letter in your briefcase I consider it a, a national artifact all of its own, but I'd like to remind you of one line in that letter that says, one core belief I have always held is that our strength as, and I will add the indispensable nation, is in, inextricably linked to the strength of our unique and comprehensive systems of alliances and partnerships. Building those bridges, maintaining the health of those ties, was his primary occupation during two years as Secretary of Defense. He carried the mantle of US power, which is immense, 
with dignity, with good humor, with respect for our allies, and with an open mind. And as he did so, one of the phrases that he would often use and that I have adopted along the way is, not all good ideas come from the country with the most aircraft carriers. <laughs> so be a listener. One of the things that he told my students was, listening isn't just hearing the words of another person. Listening is listening with a mind open and willing to be changed. That's a, that's a very different thing, and it seems to be an art form that we have lost in this current era of our country. Um, the fact that he hasn't lost it is part of why he remains one of my heroes. It's been a privilege to serve this country alongside him, to serve on a Pentagon team supporting him, and now to have the immense privilege of introducing him to the Aggies that I so love. So please welcome Mr. Jim Mattis. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for the warm welcome. Thank you, Number Professor five, Johnson. Five, <laughs> uh, but it, it's great to be back uh, after some of my public remarks. I don't often get invited back to, uh, to certain uh, friendly uh, audiences at times, and I consider all of it friendly, uh, even if at times they want to enthusiastically endorse something I said or did, or quite the opposite, unendorse it. Uh, that's what America's great, uh, that we can do that. Uh, I love the idea that we could do it right here in the Cache Valley because I guarantee you, uh, tonight in Hong Kong, those young kids over there fighting for their freedom and waving American flags don't have the right to do that. And so we should all be very proud that we heard that here today. Uh, very proud of it. <laughs> uh, I just want to... Also, I, I saw a number of veterans when I walked the line when you were all being held outside. I don't want to see if anybody was going to show up today. Uh, and uh, I saw veterans. I just want to say right up front uh, that I have an enduring respect for the veterans. I never forget my debt uh, to the veterans. Uh, they got me out of every jam I got them into, um, <laughs> which was not often a pleasant time for them. But I, we remember we had a military before we had a country. And General George Washington's Revolutionary Army turned out veterans before we even had that constitution that we were swearing to uphold and defend. And there's no monument in the country sufficient to represent all that you did. I remember one night before an attack on a city and I went out uh, it, and talked to the, the assault troops and as I was falling back from them, uh, the enemy made some problems, so I stopped for a little while uh, until the things calmed down along the line of the troops. And after the troops thought I'd moved on, I heard one of the young Marines ask his older corporal, who was probably all of 21 years old, do you think Fallujah is going to be tough in the morning, corporal? And because we have our ladies present, I'm not going to quite quote the corporal. Um, but he said, basically, hush and get some rest. We took Iwo Jima. Fallujah won't be nothing. And why do I bring it up? It's because that long line of veterans coming down provides more of a confidence and a trust in our young lads on the front lines, young gals on the front lines tonight, than any speeches by a Secretary of Defense or a General. That's not false modesty. The reality is those young Marines getting ready and sailors getting ready to assault Fallujah knew they could not face anything worse than Shiloh or Iwo Jima, and they drew strength from that example. And it shows how you can apply history to keep this great big experiment you and I call America alive, how you apply it. You don't just read about dates and what happened, but you really understand that human beings put themselves on the line in our revolution, writing our constitution, fighting for civil rights, never accepting that we were complete. We're an experiment, just a great big experiment we have no divine right to survive. Bottom line is we've all got to roll up our sleeves and help make this experiment a success by never accepting where we're at, always trying to be a better country 
more just country, a more responsive country. My personal debts especially run high, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vietnam veterans. I know there are at least two here in the audience I saw on the line, but to all the Vietnam veterans here and, and watching on the video, uh, you, I owe a special debt to you because when I came into the Marines, you were the, the veterans who raised me in the Marine Corps and taught me the grim skills that you knew that I would need one day. So that's an, uh, one special group of veterans in my lifetime that I always like to single out. And you can't come to a, a group of citizens like this as a U.S. Marine, not a Marine, but a U.S. Marine. We belong to you. We're accountable to you but also without saying uh, the enduring, unending respect for the Gold Star families that are here. We never forget their enduring sacrifice. They will live with that for their entire lives, what they sacrificed for our freedom. So my respects paid to the veterans and the Gold Star family members. They're all part of that same line of men and women who have given us these freedoms in Cache Valley this beautiful corner of America that we're in right now. I'm talking for just a little while, and Professor Johnson, you know, I've learned it's a lot easier in this world just to go along with whatever she orders me to do. Um, she's a very pushy woman. <laughs> but uh, then she's, she's going to join me. She's somehow collected up a number of, uh, of questions from students, and then we'll go through these here as she uses the ambush technique on me to see if I'm ready for them. Uh, I grew up in the, in the Pacific Northwest, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a Westerner. I come here and I look at your beautiful mountains. I'm reminded that for Americans, that marks the horizons for us. Somewhere up in the sky, we have so much freedom. And here in this, I would say it is, no matter what Jim Bridger said about it, this is the prettiest valley in the Rocky Mountains uh, that you live in. And it's great to be back. Um, I had my whole life planned. Uh, I was going to come out of uh, college. I'd just gone to college. I didn't know you had to go actually go to the class to keep your <laughs> draft deferment, uh, which I lost. But I was going to go to college. I was going to come back and teach physics and history in my high school, maybe get to coach football. I had my whole life planned. And as the Yiddish saying goes, you make your plans and God laughs. Uh, and he got a real chuckle out of mine. Um, I, uh, at the time when the draft was ongoing, I knew I'd have to go. Most of us figured we'd go. And we never thought the draft dodgers would be brought back as heroes a few years later. So rather than miss our parents' anniversaries, our sisters' weddings, whatever, uh, we decided to do our patriotic chore. Uh, I went off into the Marines, and uh, after a few years, it wasn't that I liked the jobs. I grew to hate minefields at a very young age. Uh, I uh, grew to just love the kind of Marines who would bite their lip and crawl their way into minefields probing for something they didn't want to find. And just based on the absolute delight, the absolute joy of serving alongside those young sailors and Marines, I stayed in year on year. And one thing I learned there was the co-equal commitment. Uh, there was no difference between an 18-year-old private and a 60-year-old general's commitment to carrying out the mission. They all had their own roles to play, but they looked at each other as co-equal, co-equal in every way. And I love that kind of meritocracy where that's what was your, your, basically your measure was whether or not you'd step forward when there was danger. It was also an organization that had no institutional confusion about its role. It was to fight and to fight well. Uh, and But it also... Uh, was completely satisfied with us if we gave 100%, and it was completely dissatisfied with us if we did 99%. Uh, that you veterans remember those dramatic moments in our early days in what we call boot camp, when on one occasion we're running through an obstacle course, and I was first in my platoon to go against another platoon, and I was obviously out in front of him, and I thought, ah, oh, this is going to be easy. I took my time, got all the way up, climbed the rope, touched the knot, dropped down, and there was a man bending over me who was convinced immediately that I was a communist sent in to destroy the Marine Corps. <clears throat> he said, you didn't give 100%. You decided to dog it. And he says, and you're going to hate me for the rest of your life when I get done with you. And I don't hate him for the rest of my life, but I can understand at the moments I went through uh, for about the next 10 minutes why he thought he might gain my hatred. As he uh, basically said, I'm not here to help you through your midlife crisis. You're going to learn to deliver for this country 100% of what you've got. 
And I bring this up because how do you unleash initiative and creativity? How do you unleash initiative and aggressiveness in the military has a lot to do with why the Marine Corps is feared by its enemies and very much admired by our partners. Why do our partners like serving alongside our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardmen? In the Marines case, it's oftentimes those two qualities, the initiative and aggressiveness. And one thing that Jeannie brought up when she introduced me was about trust. And ladies and gentlemen, in terms of leadership, and we, uh, we have a lot of high school students here, co college students here, you're going to be leaders someday. And if you cannot create trust, you cannot create harmony. And if you can't put that together, whether it be in, in an orchestra or on a football field or in a business or in a diocese or in a military unit, then you may be proclaimed the president of the company or the captain of the outfit or the team captain, but the people who determine if you're a leader are the subordinates, and you've got to be able to create that trust. And what do you do with it once you have it? Well, you try to get as many people inside the tent as possible. You get people inside the tent so they help solve the problem, and then you unleash that initiative, and you do it in a way that you just kind of take your hands off the steering wheel once you're certain they know what you want to do and they carry it out ethically and morally and very capably. And how you get there uh, is all built on that foundation of trust. So let me fast forward now from 40 years before when I was a second lieutenant in the infantry and talk about being the Secretary of Defense. And I walk in and we're looking at a lack of strategy right then. And it went back for 10 years. This was not a condemnation of the previous administration. More than one administration had contributed. And so what we did, we sat down immediately and began writing the strategy. And I wanted some guiding principles for the strategy. And I figured we'd better have no more than a couple, two or three. Because if, if you can't say in a couple of two or three things how you're going to guide the largest corporation in the world, which is the U.S. Department of Defense, with three million people, with people spread all around the world doing combat and building things and maintaining things and training, then you're probably going to add more to confusion than you are to cohesion, to collaboration. And what I did was I came up with these three. One, we were going to make the military more lethal. Number two, we were going to make certain that we broadened and deepened our number of allies. And number three, we were going to reform the business practices so I could look all of you in the eye and say we're not wasting your money. Number one, the lethality piece, was because I'd read too much history and how I wished I'd majored in history when I lived my life. I didn't know what was coming, so I didn't major in history. But I ended up having to read a lot. Uh, many militaries over history, throughout history, have forgotten what they existed for. And as I thought about the American military as ambassadors of the American values and the American system around the world, of them defending it, of them being sentinels of, of our system, of our people, of our, our defense, and all, it seemed to me that the, the way this would be put into practice was that the military was to ensure that they were so lethal that our diplomats would always be listened to from a position of strength. That was why we wanted a strong military. It was to deter war, to try to keep the peace for one more year, one more month, one more week, one more day, one more hour, while the diplomats worked their magic. The second line of effort, I'll go into in a minute about allies, but the third line of effort, the uh, business reform, I, was going, I knew uh, from the briefings they gave me as I prepared for my nomination hearings in front of the Senate, that the military had been underfunded, and at times it was underfunded in a very strange way. It was underfunded not by the number of dollars given it, but it was being given the dollars late in the year. It would be like we went to you and said, you have to go through the next year of your family, and we're not going to tell you how much money you're going to make until September, but you're going to have to continue to spend it the same way as last year, Say, now, wait a minute, last year I had enough money for vacation. That, I don't care. You still have to take vacation, and you still have to uh, do everything else. But in September, you might get less money, 
And now what do you do? I mean, it was just crazy the way it was running. So we put together the strategy, and for the first time in 70 years, believe it or not, the Department of Defense had never been audited. Now, many of you have business backgrounds. It had never been audited in 70 years. Now, there were some, some reasons that some people would say were valid, but in my role as the new secretary, um, my role was not to have stress. My role was to create stress, okay? <laughs> um, we were going to audit the books, and I told Congress we're going to find every mistake we're making, we're going to come up and tell you, and we're going to fix it. So that was uh, the way we went about it, uh, with, with, with that attitude. And in fact, we did get through the first two audits now of the Department of Defense in the last couple of years. And we are finding mistakes, and we're finding places to save money. And we, we're a lot more capable of going to the Congress. And if you look at the budgets the Department of Defense has had just now three years in a row, they are record-breaking budgets supported bipartisan, by, by Republican and Democrat. So for those who will tell you at times, and you'll see it in the news all the time, where nothing works in Washington, D.C., we came up with a very strong, uh, a very strong uh, strategy. I talked to senators and congressmen. I talked to allies. It took me a year to write the thing with the, some very sharp young gals and guys. And when we got done with it, it, we were able to then hang the budget on it. And for example, in December of 2018, the second year I was there, the budget I received at that time had 87% of the House and Senate Republicans and Democrats voting for it. So keep the faith with our system. I know it's got a lot of challenges right now, but Americans, given a good, strong argument, given a logical argument, can pull together. 87% is doing pretty good in any ball game. <clears throat> Let me talk about allies for a minute, the second line of effort. Uh, that one uh, took 80% of my time. 80% of my time was spent talking to foreign uh, leaders, uh, foreign militaries, uh, working with them, trying to pull teams together. I'd had the good fortune, because I'd been in the military for a long time, the privilege of fighting many times for our country. On not one occasion did I fight in an all-American formation. It was always with allies. And you have to look at where these allies came from. The, uh, when we came back from World War II, uh, there was such a sense of dismay over what had happened in the world that the greatest generation coming home said it's a crummy world, but we're part of it whether we like it or not. Whether we like it or not, we're going to have to deal with it. And so they put together this international system. You and I know it as uh, the United Nations, an imperfect organization never designed to solve all problems where people would get together and talk. Uh, we put together at Bretton Woods, 44 nations wrote up the rules of the road about finance. And you and I know what grew out of that is the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. And these would be lenders of last resort. So if people were hurting in a worldwide depression or a, a countrywide depression and they were losing hope, they wouldn't have to turn to a fascist named Mussolini. They could turn to a lender of last resort and get some money into the system, start building business and this sort of thing, put the money back into the system to help the next country. And we're trying to keep from having another depression that drove people into the arms of the fascists. The greatest generation, as Harry Truman put it, was the greatest generation, not just because they whipped the fascists, but because they then opened their arms and welcomed the Japanese and the German and the Italian people back into the community of nations. Only less than a handful of years after the war was over, that bitter, disastrous war was over. And then one day, I was in the backyard of the Australian ambassador's house in Washington, D.C., and he said, uh, and America also in that period made the single most self-sacrificial pledge in world history. And I thought I knew something about American history, but it took a foreigner to teach me this, and I learned a lot more over these years from foreigners about our country at times. And I said, you mean the Marshall Plan where we helped them out and everything with, with loans? He said, no, no, no. He said, that was very generous. He said, unbelievably generous. Conquering nations don't generally help the beaten nations get back on their feet. 
He said, no. He said, after World War II, you could have looked at Europe and said, that's twice in 25 years you've drawn us into these wars that cost us hundreds of thousands dead. And we're through with it. You're on your own. You protect yourself against the Soviet army. We're going to work with Africa and Asia. We're going to work with Latin America and the Middle East for markets. We're not being part of this anymore. He said, it wasn't necessarily just your interest, it was your value system that you were going to protect democracy in Western Europe even at the risk of 100 million dead Americans in a nuclear war. I had to be taught that by a foreigner who was not even a European who could look at it dispassionately from down in the Pacific and watch what the Americans were doing. And eventually that NATO that we built, that nuclear armed NATO, held the line and held the line and held the line until the internal rot of the Soviet Union took it down from the inside with the added push of the Eastern European nations that wanted to be free once more, the ones we couldn't protect because they were already occupied by the Soviet army by 1945. And I bring this up because that international organization, NATO, that we set up to protect Europe never goes to war. It keeps the peace year after year after year. And then the United States is attacked on 9-11 and NATO goes to war. NATO goes to war. All of their countries send troops into Afghanistan with ours. Three of those countries, by the way, have lost more boys per capita than we have lost. We Americans have lost, although it was America that was attacked. So if you ever wanted to see the penetrating wisdom of the greatest generation, uh, how they set up this network, and why I say that our security to this day, and certainly in the future, is inextricably linked to allies, and why I put so much effort into the alliance part of my job, that's the example of it right there. Actually, because 29 NATO nations went to war with us in Afghanistan, it was a total of 49 nations, there's 20 other nations from Australia and New Zealand, other nations joined up and sent troops in with us because with NATO there, it was an international organization fighting against terrorism, and we all recognized this is not something any one nation can handle, not even one nation with most of the aircraft carriers, as Jeannie mentioned. So that's why I put so much effort uh, into that, into that, uh, <clears throat> that effort. Uh, the, the, of the, the second line of effort on our, our strategy. Uh, it recognized that Russia and China are two nations that can change our way of life. We had to recognize that. It didn't mean that we're going to war with them. Matter of fact, the whole point of deterrence is not to have great power deterrence. It is to have, or even great power competition, it's to have great power peace. And that's what we're out to do uh, with, the, with the strategy that we, uh, that we adopted at that time. Uh, it's not perfect. We're in the midst of a very raucous time in our democracy and there are nations that are disappointed in us and we have the way, we have a self-correcting mechanism in America that we've always adopted and it's called elections every two years for every member of the House of Representatives and one-third of our, our Senate and certainly every four years for the White House. But I don't think right now that this nation, for whatever problems it's had, and whatever problems uh, it will have in the future, it can be looked on as other than a generous nation that's always striving to be better, never satisfied with itself, never complacent, always respectful of various points of view. At times it gets into kind of a, you lose some of the civility of it, especially around election time. But when elections are over, we all have to roll up our sleeves and go to work. And a final word on that as far as my role in the administration. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd never met Mr. Trump before I got the phone call to be interviewed. I went back and interviewed with him, and promptly he and I had a very forthright conversation. I disagreed with him three times on the three questions he asked me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I would just tell you that we walked out on the, uh, the steps, and I thought, well, that takes care of that. Back to Stanford. <laughs> And uh, we got on the steps, and, and President-elect Trump said, hey, I like this guy, and, and he hired me. And uh, I was very uh, upfront with him all the way through. We had a good relationship, and we disagreed on some things. And near the end, it was time, obviously, for me to leave. I left with no rancor. Uh, but I would tell you that we have a country here 
that is worth keeping faith in. We have a country that is worth protecting. It's a, as a World War II Marine put it once, he said the country didn't have to be perfect to be worth fighting for. And I bring that up because at times when I was young, I wanted perfection. And if something wasn't perfect, I'd sink my teeth into it like a dog with a bone and keep shaking it around. I'd ignore everything else. And as I got older, I didn't get smarter, but I became more aware that sometimes uh, you'll, you'll look at things and you'll focus on the imperfection, and that's good, so you work to correct it. But don't lose sight of the larger whole and just what you have at stake there. I think that uh, as you uh, read more history, if we can study our history and recognize how imperfect this country has been and how it continues to get better every year, and sure, there's been ups and downs, but the overall trajectory has always been one toward a more just, more responsive society. And one of the reasons I spend most of my time now talking with young people on various campuses is to talk to you about why I have that faith. It's not some la-la land faith. It's based on the rigors of our Constitution. It's based on uh, faith in the American electorate. And it certainly is not dismayed by challenges. I've seen a lot of challenges overcome on the battlefield when someone might have said, you know, this is going to be really hard. And this is where I think that the study of history uh, can really help us. I can't emphasize too strongly that we've got to get back to teaching the good and the bad and the ugly about America, not just certain things, and have a narrow parochial view of America. An honest view of America puts all of it out there so that our young people have the image and the vision that the Australian ambassador had of America, as well as what we all share here, perhaps here in this valley where back in 1863 in the Shoshone massacre, we saw where we didn't live up to our higher standards. So we recognize it, we work on it, we make amends, we get better. And if we keep in mind from the good things to the tough things, uh, that we're always trying to do better. If we try to lead our country the way George Washington led his army that humbled the Redcoats who would defeat Napoleon a few years later, and it was very simple the way he did it. He would listen to his free men who didn't want to obey orders from somebody from another state. He would learn from them what they thought and that sort of thing. He'd really listen to them, really learn from them. Then he would help them. He'd help them understand. He'd help them get rations. He'd help them get uniforms or whatever. And then he would lead them. I think we're forgetting too often right now to listen and to learn, to build bridges to each other. You know, I was the Secretary of Defense. I had to look at terrorism, and yes, it's bad, and we're going to have to deal with it, ladies and gentlemen, for a good many years to come. And I had to look at what China was doing in the theft of intellectual property and espionage and that sort of thing and what Russia was threatening to do with nukes. I looked at North Korea's nukes and missiles and Iran's and all that. And I knew that we, it wouldn't be beautiful if we had to fight, but I knew we could protect America. And we've got to work hard to keep that edge so that none of the authoritarians ever get brave and think now's the time to test us. Let's hang on to the peace. Let's stay so strong that our diplomats are always respected. But what worries me more than anything is the way we're treating one another in this country, the contempt we show for one another just because we sometimes disagree with each other. You know, I think it's very, very important that we learn to listen, to really listen to each other and understand each other's position as well as they understand their position so we start from a position of dispassionate discussion, even on passionate subjects. I think it's absolutely essential. And oftentimes history will tell you how people in the past dealt with similar situations and dealt with them successfully or unsuccessfully. It's not that they ever gave the history lessons, gave me all the answers as I kept reading over the years where the Marine Corps requires you at each rank you get promoted, you get a new reading list. It's not that it gives you the answers, but it will give you many of the questions. For example, in the middle of one fight, I remember wanting to uh, do something to trap uh, a terrorist. And the idea I had came from the U.S. Army's uh, Geronimo campaign back in the late 1880s. And, and we started, we, we used computers now to look at where to put the outposts and all. But it, history really does help you. But more than that, it humbles you. 
it shows you that if Martin Luther King, who's uh, with the celebration we had yesterday, if he could go to Jamaica and write an article when he was in his, I think, his 20s, and it said chaos or community. Now, since my call sign is chaos, I thought that was, might have been directed to me. Uh, <clears throat> But in fact, it was chaos in its truest sense. And basically talking about how are we going to come together and work together and create a community of shared interests, or are we going to have chaos? He, he saw brilliantly into the, with clarity what we, the choice that we have on some of these things. And to have a country that's given that choice, the, the boys and girls in Hong Kong tonight don't have a choice. They're trying to carve one out. And they're not doing well at it right now, even if they wave American flags in the street to show what values they stand for. So let me stop there, ladies and gentlemen, because Jeannie's uh, already crossing her legs on me, which means it's, she's getting ready to come up. Uh, but uh, here we go. We're going to see now how I do as, uh, as she waterboards me. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> So we gathered in questions from a lot of our different Aggie students, and some of these are composite, some of these are verbatim, but we wanted students to have a chance to ask some questions of our guest while he's here. So the first one is, how do you think average Americans can be convinced to pay more attention to foreign policy? Yeah, well, average Americans, <clears throat> uh, God bless you. I, I would like to think I'm as high as average. Um, <laughs> I, I say that because I, I think that most Americans are, are modestly about themselves, but they look much more broadly at their neighbors. They help each other. I've been in countries, very sophisticated countries, uh, ones many of our traditions grew out of. They don't have nearly the level of charity work and the, near, the, the level of neighborly concern that I see in many of the towns across Utah, a state I admire I'm not from here, I just admire it greatly. And when you have Americans who care about each other, just almost as, I don't know if it's the pioneer spirit or whatever it is, uh, maybe just a sense of being Americans, the most important thing for them is they have to admire and trust whoever's talking to them. If you don't trust someone, then how do you get, uh, how do you get to a point where you're going to believe in them? And I think if we could get our leadership in Washington, D.C. to be rewarded for virtuous behavior, to be rewarded for working collaboratively across party lines and solving problems, then you would have people listening to them when they say, why we need allies, why do we need to have a military this big, or, or we don't. Uh, I think what we have to do is have a message that's clear, uh, you've heard my message on allies. I mean, we could vote in here tonight. How many agree? How many disagree? But I think you have to have people come out of government and talk to groups like this and make the pitch. And then you have to vote and you have to work uh, to support the values that you think are right. So it's mostly based on trust and a clear message. And I think we can do that on most of what we're doing in America. Not everything. We don't do everything right. We're the good guys. We're not the perfect guys. When preparing to make a decision or give an opinion, what part of your decision-making process do you spend the most time on or put the most effort into? Oh, that's easy. Um, the, the, what I found was uh, Einstein, he's supposed to be a smart guy that lived a while ago, he said that uh, when you're going, he was asked once, if you had to save the world, how would you compose your thoughts? And he said something along the lines of, I'd spend 55 minutes defining the problem, setting the problem in its own unique circumstance, and then, so, and then save the world in five minutes. So I think what we need to do more and more, I don't care whether it's health care or gun issues or immigration, we need to break the problem down into bite-sized pieces and make sure that we're defining the problem, we all agree on the problem. Because if you don't agree on the problem, then there's no chance when a solution is rolled out, you're going to say, oh, that's a good idea, because you never agreed on the problem in the first place. So we call it problem setting in the military. You set the problem in its unique circumstance before you start problem solving. And we haven't always done it well, and that's one of those lessons right there that was written in blood, by the way. 
Uh, so, I, But I'd spend a lot of time gaining concurrence on what is the problem you're trying to solve. What's your favorite position you've ever held? Oh, that's easy. Uh, second lieutenant in the Marine Infantry. Um, at, the, at that point, um, you're right down there. You're, you're laying in the same mud with your sailors and Marines. You have the same comfort level, which is zero. Um, <laughs> But, but you learn you'd rather suffer in good company than be in the company of delicate men. You know what I mean? Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful place. It's a place where you see guys. I, I was talking to some guys once at an outpost in, in Afghanistan, and then I walked off down a trail to go catch up with my radio operators. He decided to leave me there because they were tired of waiting on me. Um, and as I was walking along, two, a soaking wet sailor and marine were walking toward me. They'd just gone down to a filthy, dirty irrigation ditch and cleaned up, okay? So they're walking back, soaking wet, and, and I, normally I'd just say, how you doing, young man? <coughs> and uh, the marine said, living the dream, sir, living the dream. And the sailor said, no Maserati, no problem, you know? <laughs> There, there's such a sense of rustic living. There, there's a, there's a, just a, a kind of a, just a happy-go-lucky, carefree spirit in those lads that, uh, you know, you, you, you drew from it every day. I, I'd like to tell you I got the same kind of energy when I was living and working in Washington, D.C., but I cannot tell a lie, okay? <laughs> well, interestingly, that leads to our next question. What was most difficult about serving as Secretary of Defense? Uh, probably um, in my first, uh, well, let me back off. It, it, civilian control of the military means that every ship that deploys, uh, every aircraft that goes overseas, every Army infantry company that goes out, every time they go, uh, a Secretary of Defense, a civilian, signs the deployment order. That's civilian control of the military. In other words, the Joint Staff that works for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs would say that over in Afghanistan they need two infantry companies, a special force detachment, and by the way, we need an aircraft carrier to replace the one that's out there now. And this book would come in twice a week, it would have anywhere from 10 to 30 deployment orders. And the first day I'm standing at this stand-up desk and I see this come in. Now I'd been the Executive Secretary for two Secretaries of Defense. There was no mystery to the job. I knew what the how. I knew they worked every weekend. I knew they worked on holidays. I knew what it was like to sign letters to next to kin. And that caused me to pause as I looked at that thick book, realizing now it was going to be up to me to determine not just how to carry it out, but should they go. So I wrote out, hand wrote out a card and taped it. And I didn't want it typed up. I wanted to remind myself I'd written this with a question. It said, does this deployment contribute sufficiently to the well-being of the American people that, that it justifies the death of these troops. Not going in harm's way, not possibly getting injured, could I justify the death of those troops? And I hope every time I read a deployment order for a submarine here, an airplane there, an infantry unit over there, I hope that I was able to answer that question in a way that I can live with. So that, that was the tough part. When you're sending, the, sending them off overseas <clears throat> to defend this great big experiment and you're not going yourself. It was easier, and many of you in this room who are veterans know what I mean, it's easier to go yourself than to put your family in the waiting role, to put, uh, to put others in harm's way. It's actually easier to go yourself. That was the hardest part. Well, here's an easy one. What course of action will lead to peace in the Middle East? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, here, here's the thing. It's been the source of a lot of problems. And if you go back into the history uh, and you look at the religious cross-currents and the political cross-currents, colonialism's impact, terrorism, radicalization, you see all of it in this cauldron. <clears throat> and I think what we have to look at there is bringing in people who know the history sufficiently well 
to recognize there are no grand bargains here. You're not going to make one great big peace treaty and suddenly everyone's going to sign up. So what we have to do, again, is break the problem down into what do we do about the situation in Lebanon as an international community? What can the UN do? What can the Arab League do? What do we do about the situation having to do with minority religions or minority political groups in the region? And we're going to have to work on little, little steps, baby steps. How do you make something better? Don't, because if we keep trying to go for big solutions, and, and, and God bless Bill Clinton, he almost pulled it off there at Camp David when, uh, when, when uh, Yasser Arafat pulled out. But I just don't believe the big grand bargains are possible anymore. And I've served out in that region, ladies and gentlemen, since 1979. And some of the people out there, when they say girls don't go to school, and when they say that you've got to pray a certain way, uh, don't patronize them. They really believe this. And until education, economic opportunity, and a change in some of the practices of the nations or the religions there can occur, we're going to have to hold the line and try to make baby steps as we take each of these issues forward uh, within the realm of the possible. So I would, I, would I would break the problems down into those bite-sized pieces and then find the communities of interest that would work on And there's a lot of good people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and work on them. But if you make it too big, it'd be like trying to swallow an elephant in one bite, you know? And it's going to choke you. So that, that's the way I'd go about it. How do we restore the confidence of allies? Well, I think we, we follow George Washington's uh, dictum of you, you, you listen and you learn and you help and you lead. Uh, remember that we need those allies. It's not a one-way street. Now, the allies, too, I mean, I've heard uh, I was a supreme allied commander at NATO uh, for years, and I would be in the room when uh, presidents of different parties, American parties, went and said to Europe, you've got to pay more. Uh, for example, uh, it's how you go about trying to get them to carry more of their share of the burden. When I came into the job, one of my first meetings, I had to make a trip to Korea and Japan because of the urgency of that challenge. My next trip, I believe, was to NATO. Now, I'd sat in that big room with 29 other nations. Uh, there's two Supreme Allied commanders who sit at the table with the political leaders, and I'd been one. So I knew many people in the room. They knew me. Uh, they knew the issue, uh, one of the major issues that brought President Trump's administration in to Washington was uh, allies not paying their fair share. And so, uh, of course, being it's the United States, you speak first in the, uh, when you get into the group there uh, by common consent, I might add. And I said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I've sat in this very room as various secretaries of defense for Republican Democrats have said, you've got to pay more. And it's now manifested politically in America. And here's my message to you. You cannot expect me to go home to America and look Americans in the eye and say, you have to pay more taxes and you have to care more about the freedom for European children in the future than European parents are willing to care and, and sacrifice for. You need to come through now. You've got to raise the money that we're putting into NATO's defense. And they'd already started because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine a year and a half before. But it was a way, uh, during the break, all the ministers came over to shake my hand. I thought I was going to lose some rapport because I was very blunt about it. I didn't lose rapport. So it's how you do things. I remember Condoleezza Rice when she was the Secretary of State telling a bunch of us young generals and admirals, uh, she, they would bring various government officials in to, to talk to us, to teach us how to be generals and admirals. And she looked like she had a finger about 27 inches long as she <laughs> waved it at us. And she said, and you remember, admirals and generals, around here we do things with our allies, not to them. Okay, so remember, most of us, like me, we got over and joined public humiliation by second grade, okay? So let's not publicly humiliate our allies, work with them. Recognize they have parliaments too, they have to vote taxes too. 
They've got schools they want to build too. Show respect for what they're going through, but at the same time advocate strongly and persuasively that these values that grew out of the Reformation and the Enlightenment are worth defending. And we're going to have to defend them. You look at what's happened in President Xi's China, in North Korea, in Iran. You look at Hong Kong right now. You look at Russia and what Putin has just done, uh, basically saying he's going to stay in power as long as he chooses. Uh, our values have got to be defended. And I think we can make a very strong argument for it if we follow Condoleezza Rice's point. We do things with our allies, not to them. This last question is from one of our high school students, so I appreciate your participation. He says, I start out my morning in a U.S. history class where we learn about the slaughter of Native Americans, then move to my AP government class where we learn about our current toxic politics, and next to my finance class where we study our insurmountable national debt. Can you please tell me something positive about this country that I can believe in? That's a great question. Um, and it's a great question because we have to have the honesty to look at what we're doing right now. And I am very concerned that people with my color hair do not want to tax themselves sufficiently to pay for all the government services, and we just keep raising that debt. We just keep raising it, and it, to me it is intergenerational theft that we're then going to turn to young people and say, thank you very much, you pay the interest on this. To show you how much damage it can do, ladies and gentlemen, that debt is owned by countries overseas, and not all of those countries are our allies. The debt, if we go back to traditional interest rates, by this year we could be paying more money servicing our debt, our interest, paying interest on our debt, than we pay for the Department of Defense. That is not a healthy thing. No country has maintained its military power and thus maintained its freedom if it didn't maintain its fiscal house in order. It didn't maintain its solvency. So why, why do I start with that? Because I think it's time for all of us to get together and start talking about generations about climate change, about debt, about education, and we can do that. We actually have a society that is set up to do that if we'll simply take the time to do it. Why do I feel so positive about this? Again, I was in the infantry, named for infant soldier, young soldier. You cannot go there and see the level of sacrifice. How about seeing young lads, 18, 19 years old, day after day, taking a loose tourniquet and wrapping it around their upper legs and la wrapping it and just tight enough that it won't fall off. And that way, if their leg gets blown off on patrol, they're going to snap the tourniquet shut so they don't bleed to death. And they don't do that one time. They do that day after day after day. 18, 19 years old, they believe in this country so much, they're willing to do that. And every step, you know what can happen. And so I would suggest to you that something that has that much optimism from people who are literally putting their lives on the line, people who are signing a blank check to every one of us in this room with their lives, payable with their lives. There is something in there worthwhile. Dig through the history, you'll find the good, the bad, and the ugly. But the bottom line is there's a lot more good in this country even if we don't talk about it right now. I have absolute faith in the American people. I know the military will hold the line as we come back to fundamental friendliness respect for one another. As long as we can have talks where we listen to each other, where we have protesters in, at least for a minute, poor guy, I'll try and find him later on. Um, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> at, at least so long as we can have the kind of open discussions that allow us to work on these problems, I know we can solve them. We're the greatest experiment in the history of the world. And one thing, let me just close with something here, because it does relate to this high school student's question. Walter Lippmann was a graduate of Yale, and in 1940, you'll remember the bombs are raining down on London, uh, Paris has fallen to the Nazi stormtroopers, and he talked to Yale graduates, and he's, a, he's an alum, and sometimes people in colleges can talk to fellow students, colleagues, 
Something about the atmosphere, the shared formative experience, allows you to say things that are uncomfortable in other circumstances. One of the reasons I love coming to college is, uh, but here's what Walter Lippmann said. You took the good things for granted. Now you must earn them again. For every right you cherish, you have a duty which you must fulfill. For every hope you entertain, you have a task you must perform. For every good you wish to preserve, you will have to sacrifice your comfort and your ease. There is nothing for nothing any longer. I bring this up because America was sitting on the sidelines as the fascists were on the march. England was holding out alone. France was overcome. The Japanese were on the attack. The Italians were deep into Africa. Everything was going wrong. And we came out of that and look at the country the greatest generation built. I know I was part of the luckiest generation because I was one of the ones they raised. I'm not sure my generation's doing as good for that high school student as my parents' generation did for me. And it's time we recover that and remember Walter Lippmann's words. But thank you very much, John. It's an honor to be back here. Thank you.